everyone. Welcome to a new episode. Today's a little bit different, audio only. So uh, go ahead and clean your house, do something cool, and learn some cool things about, or maybe some not so cool things about centralized exchanges. Our guest here today is Wesley Pryor. He is the founder of Liquid Malta. He is an advisor for HXRO Games and the former head of trading at Enigma Capital. So ton of insight coming to you today to talk about centralized exchanges, trading bots, and uh, lots of other things. So hi, Wesley. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Hey, Heidi. Thanks for having me. So let's get right into it. One of the things... Oh, okay. Let's... let's before I do that, I'm getting ahead of myself. Can, <laughs> can, can uh, you tell the audience today a little bit about, you know, your background in this space and how... The things that you've, you know, learned and uh, how you've accrued enough information to to understand what is happening with centralized exchanges, their behaviors, and so tell us a little bit about yourself, Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no worries. Um, yeah, so I like I like to say that I started trading um, digital assets when I was 11 years old, um, but that was because I was um, addicted to. A, uh, an MMORPG called RuneScape uh, when it came out in uh, 2001. And, you know, that kind of got me into this, um, you know, kind of digital, this digital world of trading and acquiring um, digital goods, you know, whether they're worth something or not is kind of left to the market to decide, um, kind of like a lot of altcoins you see today um, with a very wide, wide range of valuations. But that kind of got me into um, dealing in, in digital assets um, in a in a kind of in a way that I know a lot of people can probably resonate with. That led me to um, you know start doing some botting to you know kind of level up characters uh, while I was at class or sleeping and whatnot. And that that kind of led me to um, you know building computers, um, modding modding computers and making them faster so that I could run more bots. Um, which, you know, turned out to be really useful um, later on in life. If you think about like those skills, like those are kind of, those are kind of like two core elements that go into, you know, GPU mining in, um, you know, what was uh, like the primary mining uh, channel for, or production um, process for Bitcoin back in the day. And then I ultimately went to grad school for um, a master's in accounting, which was kind of like the finance end of the spectrum. So I heard about Bitcoin in um, late 2013, did a little research, figured out I could build a a gaming computer with a few extra graphics cards and I could start getting getting involved mining. You know, that that kind of dovetailed into uh, really wanting to understand more about, you know, the financial underpinnings of what actually gives Bitcoin and other proof of work mineable cryptocurrencies value. That was kind of the center of my focus, you know, up until leading up up until launching um, Enigma Capital uh, with a few really bright, like-minded individuals. And, uh, you know, leading into Liquid Malta, you know, while I was at Enigma, I kind of saw this recurring theme of, um, you know, tons of projects launching uh, literally every day across uh, dozens of different um, tiny little, tiny little markets. Um, So Mm -hmm. it kind of, it kind of felt, it kind of felt a lot like digital assets back when I was a kid, but um, like even crazier because back then you were just trading, like you would, you would access markets on, you know, random sites or on eBay and whatnot. Um, now it's like, okay, you've got dozens of little markets, but, uh, anyway, I started to see this recurring theme of where projects would launch and there just literally wouldn't be any activity in that market at all. Whereas other markets had tons of activity right at the start. And uh, I really, I really, um, kind of, kind of um, figured out that the markets that weren't um, doing anything or, or, or you know, would, would, would launch and have a few low orders that would get filled and kind of tank the price entirely on like a few, like a, like a $10 trade were markets that, you know, unlike traditional, uh, unlike traditional markets had uh, no market makers or no, no, no specialists in that market putting up liquidity. You know, I, for the life of me, I tried to find a good liquidity provider that I could trust. And mm-hmm. um, I, I really canvassed the space thoroughly. You know, all the market makers were, you know, set up in Hong Kong or like they were just really shady. They'd be like, you know, send me, send me, you know, 50 Bitcoin and then the equivalent in your coin and, you know, we'll take care of the market for you. 
And like that, that would be like over email. And I'm like, this is just crazy. Like, <laughs> like this is crazy. So that, that led me into really um, thinking that this was an area that, you know, was not only going to be worth focusing a lot of time and attention on, but was also desperately needed for, you know, any of these projects to have a chance to succeed. So that's kind of the, sh- the short as I can of, of what, you know, brings me here today. So I know the, you know, market makers get a bad rap and you're trying to fix that. So Liquid Solutions is fully regulated in Malta. So you're, you're doing things as by the book as you can transparently. So I do want to address probably what most people are going to be interested in in this interview first. So as a treat, uh, we're going to do that. <laughs> sure. um, I'd love to know your thoughts on how to spot a scammy exchange. For example, their typical behaviors or things that the, the average person can can watch for. Totally. Um, there's there's a few things that, that I look for that are just like red flags just right off right out the gate. You know, one of the one of the first things is, you know, whether the exchange has a private API. Uh, But, you know, whether they have a public API or not, if they don't have a public API, but you see a lot of activity on that exchange, a lot of small projects getting listed, they're probably, it's probably because they have a trading desk um, that the exchange themselves are operating. So um, a lot of the times, you know, that exchange really just exists to entice token issuers to pay big listing fees. And then they'll have, they'll have their own desk just doing a bunch of wash trading and they call that quote unquote market making. Um, but really mm-hmm. they've got no users there and they're really just, they're in business to rip off, you know, token issuers. And then anyone foolish enough to think that there's real volume that ends up buying, you know, whatever cryptic asset is it, their, uh, with their wash trading there. So no public API is a red flag. Another like super obvious red flag is if they have an asset that's trading with high volumes, but they have, you know, very little order book depth. So if you're seeing, um, just as an example, if you're seeing an asset on an exchange that's trading with like a few million dollars of turnover per day on coin market cap or whatever you're looking at, and then you click into that market and you look at the order book and there's like only a few hundred dollars on the bid, um, on the, on the buy side of the order book. Um, mm. that's a really, that's a really good sign that, that, that activity is fake and there's not actually real trading activity happening in that market. Another, another one would be if you have like non-standard deposit and withdrawal times, uh, for the same like native chain assets, like one Ethereum token can be withdrawn within five hours. The other one can be withdrawn like at the speed of like confirmations. Um, oh, that's a know, really good non, point. Yeah. Non-standard, non-standard withdrawal times for the same class of assets or like longer than you would normally expect for a confirmation on a given blockchain to happen. Um, mm. You know, that's that's a sign that they're managing the in, inflows and outflows of the exchange. And that means that they're they're likely doing that because they're managing their own positions at the exchange. And um, mm. you have you have to think. You have to think from the uh, from like kind of the perspective of an exchange operator. Uh, these exchanges, a lot of them are like offshore. Like they're not they're not held to like any regulatory standard, and they have like tons and tons of information about their users, and they also have very very powerful levers that they can pull. Um, so they can they can effectively create trading opportunities for themselves, and they can <laughs> censor they can censor they can bait they can one bait users in. And two, mm-hmm. censor users from uh, making profitable, p- taking profitable positions and closing them before they can. So that's kind of like if you see, I guess the, the la- that dovetails into the last one. Like if you see this like weird um, coin that you've never heard of before that's trading on, you know, one exchange with high volume and that e- there's no private API or there's a private API in the exchange. Like you can't, you can't access their public API and, um, you know, that asset is not really, not really, um, there's no market for it on any other exchange. Um, mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, it's going up really, really quick. Um, that, it's like, like on coin market cap, when you go to like the, the biggest gainers section, and it's like, what coin is that? Yeah, <laughs> it's up yeah, a exactly, thousand percent. Exactly. Exactly. It's <laughs> yeah. a thousand percent. 
it's on like one tiny little exchange. Like you've <laughs> never heard of that exchange before. And it's like, you know, you get, you get this weird feeling when you're thinking about signing up for it, a gut feeling. Exactly. Like, should I, yeah. should I send some Bitcoin there? Like, I don't know, <laughs> but it's going up so much. Like that's a, that's a good sign that, you know, they've got that exchange has a position open or, and they're doing something like they're probably going to profit and mm-hmm. you're very unlikely to profit. Like I've seen some pretty, I've seen some pretty crazy scenarios where like exchanges will literally block you from selling or block you from withdrawing if they don't have the, like just crazy stuff. So mm-hmm. um, those are some red flags that I look for. Oh, what, what are your thoughts on IEOs? These new version of ICOs where exchanges are hosting them, they're marketing them. Um, it's supposedly easier for the coin because they're automatically go- will be listed on that exchange. Is that just like another way for these exchanges to have a step up over normal users or and over that coin as well? Uh, that's a That's a really good question. I mean, honestly, and this is kind of an unpopular opinion, I think IEOs are, for the most part, a way for token projects that couldn't sell their coins last year in the bear market <laughs> to, to, to yeah. unload them on retail investors this year. Oh, um, that's honestly, like, I think that's what it is. But, you know, at the same time, um, a lot of these are selling out. And the good thing, like the really good thing that I do like about IEOs is the exchanges are able to coordinate with the market makers and mm. underwrite and underwrite the valuations that they're going to open these ex- these at um, at you know rock bottom valuations that they believe will be oversold or oversubscribed mm. and you know I think I think I think that's a, I think that's a good mechanic which can be you know really lucrative for people that are looking to buy um, buy some of these projects that they do like. Um, mm. at kind of rock bottom valuations um, because the, it's in the exchanges, like the, pro, the, pro, the mindset from the project is they want to sell their, their coins at the highest valuation possible. So the project mm-hmm. wants the exchange to list it at like a crazy high valuation. But the exchange knows that all the, all the traders want to buy at low valuations and sell at high valuations. And the exchange is going to make the most money off the trading activity. So the exchange uh, will open it up at a really low valuation, um, (laughs) despite what the projects want, right? I think that's a good mechanic. But overall, I think it's just a way to unload coins that they couldn't unload last year. That's Um, a really interesting point. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I would say the other thing that's a little scary is you don't, you don't, you can't actually see like money flowing in. So you see IEOs happening on some of these really cryptic, like little (laughs) weird exchanges. And honestly, like I haven't, they're like, okay, we just sold a million five of these tokens. And I have no idea if they collected like $10,000 or a million dollars, you know, whereas if a, if a sale is done, you know, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can trap, you can trace all those transaction flows. So you know, there's other, every time you like have something happen on a centralized exchange, I mean, you really, you really don't have any like comfort level there. Going back a little bit, talking about trading bots, how the exchanges can use them to create fake volume, to lure in both the coins wanting to be listed there to justify extravagant coin listing costs and also to lure in users who think they're actually going to be buying a coin that other people are are trading but it's just you in exchange <laughs> um so what are your thoughts on trading bots are they good are they bad it's normal people not just exchanges can use trading bots to kind of take advantage of the markets being open 24 7 so they can you know get an hour of sleep or so uh so what are your thoughts on trading bots and uh yeah. Are they good? Are they evil? What's going on? Um, you know, I mean, trading bots are, bots are really just technology. You know, I can't say whether they're they're you know, they're the bots themselves aren't good or more bad. It's all about the human that has programmed them to do a certain thing. <laughs> so has that, has that, is that program, is that program developed to be malicious? Like is it mm-hmm. developed to do to spoof trades and just do wash trading? Is it is it designed to place big orders um, down deep in the order book to make it seem like there's um, a lot of interest in that market or you know tilt the order book one way or another 
with no intent of actually letting those orders get filled. You know, things like that are kind of the evil side of botting. Uh, but really, the bot is just executing the instructions based on what the developer has created. So what's the developer's intent? I think that gives you your answer. You know, a lot of bots, you know, can be configured for absolute legitimate reasons. So if there were, because, you know, people say bots are everywhere in exchanges, which is definitely true. If bots didn't exist in trading cryptocurrencies, what would the order books look like? If it was just like real people doing real trades? Um, would it look any differently or how can you, how can you tell if, if like an exchange is all bots, if you're just looking at its order book, is that possible? Um, if it's all bot, okay. So yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to limit this question to the <laughs> cryptocurrency markets. Um, okay. this is like, this is like, you know, what was, what were the markets like before electronic trading, you know, <laughs> okay. uh, it would look a lot, it would look a lot like that. The, there would be a lot less activity. So if there were no if there were no bots in the market, you'd have a lot less efficiency. So mm -hmm. um, you know there's there's bots there's bots that are configured to do all different types of things. You've got bots that are configured to arbitrage when prices um, you know pull apart on in the same asset on different markets. Um, they'll profit on the inefficiencies there and, and capture a risk free profit. You've got bots that are running and are just you know, fighting each other to close a really tight spread. So, you know, if you if I buy for 100 and sell to you for 101, um, I make I make one as my profit. There's bots that are fighting to capture those tiny little um, tiny little margins. If you take those bots out of the market, you've just got a, t a lot less activity markets. A lot of like if you look at the kind of offshore crypto exchange market, you've got markets that are only bots and have no users. And that's where things are, you know, really unhealthy. So I'll give you an example. You know, if you look at, I won't call out any particular exchanges, but I mean, if you take, <laughs> a, if, you take if you take a look down the list and you start, if you start poking around, um, you'll see an exchange that has like really high volume numbers. And then if you mm -hmm. click in and you start, you start peeking around and looking at the markets, you'll see just a bunch of activity, a bunch of small orders kind of, um, you know, getting filled left and right and printing on the tape. But if you actually stare at that market um, and you, you'll see there's there's not actually any depth there. Like so there's no mm -hmm. real money sitting in the order books and you'll see these trades printing on the tape. So you'll see, you know, past trade history, like new trade, new trade, new trade. Uh, but um, you'll never actually see those sit on the order books. And that's because the exchange is just trading in the spread. So they'll set uh, a wide spread and they'll execute, you know, a, uh, a limit sell order and a market buy order to take that order simultaneously. Like you, you can't even see it happen. It happens so quickly. And then okay. it, and then it, and then it prints um, that a trade took place, but you as a <laughs> user never, even if you were there ready to take that order, you never would have had a chance to take it. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, it's that's, not meant for you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, it's not meant, it's not meant for you. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's an instance where you've literally just got an, an exchange that's running malicious bots and there's no users and anyone there has just kind of been baited in. Um, or the exchange is trying to, um, they're trying to climb the ranks in exchange volume so that they can reach out to token projects and say, hey, you know, our exchange is doing a ton of volume. Do you want to get your coin listed here? You know, it, it only costs uh, five Bitcoin or 10 Bitcoin or whatever. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the strategy. And yeah. That's, um, that's not a good thing. No. <laughs> and um, they can also do that to, you know, manipulate the price as well also. So assuming they're holding a lot of coins of a certain coin that, you know, just got listed, brand new listing, ha big old bag of coins, and they want to see the price <laughs> go up. Um, how can they how can they do that with the price? If they've got kind of a corner on the market. So if this if this coin is trading on, you know, this exchange and this exchange only, or if it's trading on this exchange and like really, maybe it's on a few other exchanges, but there's just really no activity there. That exchange can effectively do whatever they want with the price. So, you know, they could set a bunch of sell orders, you know, going up, you know, from one to a hundred, whatever. 
and they can just, you know, with another account, take those orders and, you know, create the um, appearance that there's a lot of um, organic buying and mm. that the price is going up a lot. And then if they're piped into, you know, all the coin listing sites, um, that's when you'll see, that's when you'll see like some coin kind of pop out of nowhere and start climbing the ranks. But as like a, as like a trader, you know, you might be watching it and being like, oh, wow, there's this coin I've never heard of before. And it's, it's only on this tiny little exchange. And like, you know, it's really starting to get some momentum. I better get in before, uh, yeah, right. Before, before other people discover it, you know, this is my um, chance to get in early. Like, yeah, that, that's like, a, that's like a logical, that's like a logical thing to think of. But really yeah. the exchange, you know, they, they could have, they could have taken their fee from the project in tokens. Uh, they could have, you know, had, had the, the team lock all their tokens up or they could block mm-hmm. the team from depositing tokens on the exchange. Oh my um, goodness. Right. And then they could take they could take those tokens and they could just effectively, you know, buy them from themselves to (laughs) inflate the price up to a high valuation, way higher than their basis, which is like effectively zero. Then if you the kind of like savvy, like I found something early trader come in and start buying it, then, you know, they're really just you're really just buying from the exchange at a really inflated valuation that they created yeah you think you think oh a lot of people are going to find this to be valuable so you're going to buy it and then no it's just you and <laughs> they're good luck trying to sell it back to the exchange at a higher rate the, the, exchange, uh, the exchange just printed a lot of money and and unloaded it to you so that's a way that market makers can have a very bad rap Um, so I know that liquid Malta or liquid solutions, Malta is a market maker. Um, I'm assuming you're not trying to be that manipulative. How does what you do? How is that better? Yeah. I mean, the pro the problem is that, uh, people are using market making interchangeably with market manipulation and true and true market making is not a manipulative activity whatsoever. Uh, market making you know, like I was describing to you earlier, is really, um, is really, it's essential for any market to kind of get off the ground um, and be efficient. Like every single market needs a market maker. Um, mm. You know what? What we do, you know, if you haven't, if you have an early stage project that is looking to come to market in a legitimate way, um, you know, we work closely with those teams to make that possible, and we put up and we put up liquidity in that market um, on you know, reputable exchanges that we know um, that we can trust. And that really sets the stage for uh, a project having price discovery and also being efficient for, for you know, its users to buy and sell what, without incurring significant transaction costs. You know, I see, okay. a lot of mar- I see a lot of markets that, you know, they're utility tokens. So you need to buy the token to access the product or service, whatever that might be, you know, storage, um, you know, Chuck E. Cheese token, like whatever that, whatever it might mm-hmm. be, like you have to buy, you have to buy that token to access the, the product. Mm-hmm. And if, if the product costs a dollar, but it costs you, you know, 20 cents extra to buy it because the market is so thin and it costs you another 20 cents to sell it. Um, you you act, you effectively paid a dollar 40, um, mm-hmm. to access that same product. So we remove those type of inefficiencies with market making. Um, you know, market manipulation is where you're doing things like wash trading to entice users to buy. You're, you're creating fake markets or you're creating, you know, you're tilting the order book one way or the other to make it seem like there's a lot of, you know, buyers or sellers to manipulate the price up or down. You know, those, that is not, that's not market making, even though people in this, in crypto, um, use the terms interchangeably, that's market manipulation. And, Mm. um, you know, I think kind of as a lot of these little um, centralized exchanges that are abusing their customers, both, you know, the the projects that are listing there and the people that are, um, you know, buying and selling on the, their exchanges. Um, I think as these kind of shenanigans start to, you know, become better, better, like become more exposed via, um, you know, sessions like this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think I think they're going to go away and I think the mar- market manipulation is going to go away 
And I think, um, you know, market making um, is going to be kind of a, a staple for projects that want to get off the ground because you, you really just can't, you can't, you can't do it without it. Yeah. I, and you know, uh, coin market cap is the, the, pl- or it's not the only place, but it seems to be the most popular location for people to get information about coins or exchanges. And they finally decided to start having an effort to hold these exchanges to a certain standard to be listed on their website. I'm not sure how strict of a standard they're setting, but at least it's something. But um, like I was just reading an article on Coindesk talking about how I think it said they're still going to list the other exchanges, but they're going to be lower on the list. (laughs) So it's like uh, lots of lots of moving pieces here of like how these exchanges get exposed, how people get exposed to these exchanges is, you know, if it wasn't for things like coin market cap, they wouldn't even know that it was happening, you know? Total, totally. Um, I think coin market cap is a fantastic resource, but mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's very difficult because even for exchanges, it's so hard to tell, you know, you legitimate users for, from, from like manipulative ones, you know, you can imagine like coin market cap has fantastic coverage of, like just about any asset that's ever come to the market. I mean, there's a lot more that you won't see there, but like mm-hmm. any asset that has any legitimacy whatsoever, um, coin market cap does a great job of getting them on there. You know, what, what becomes kind of impossible, especially in this market that's global with no kind of like agreed upon standards and very uh, like a growing user base that has to like catch up to the rest of the user's knowledge. Like if you, if you like go and, like if you go to a meetup, like if I go to any Bitcoin meetup, most people there are brand new. And it was the same mm-hmm. way, like when I would go to a Bitcoin meetup a few years ago, like most of the people are brand new. And like, it's just, there's so many new people coming in. Like, how do you bridge the gap between the people that like can easily yeah. recognize that in, that something is scammy and those that are like, just they're getting in the <laughs> space and they have no idea. A lot of these exchanges you know, they'll, they'll bring, they'll get them on there and they'll be legitimate at first. And then they'll start, they'll, then they'll like turn mm-hmm. on the bots, you know, and start mm-hmm. scooping up the wash <laughs> trading. Like it's, it's so hard to have comprehensive coverage and also like self-regulate, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it becomes like, it's like a scaling issue. Like, um, I'm sure that I'm sure they'll get better at it, but you know, for the experienced user, they're still a really good resource. So let's say an average trader has really big ambitions to (laughs) affect the price of a coin. Um, Is that something that's possible? Uh, If, I mean, I'm guessing if a coin has a pretty low trading volume, you can, you know, place a pretty, like place like a hundred dollar for some coins, you could place a hundred dollar trade and then, the coin is going to skyrocket. <laughs> um, but at that point, you're just kind of playing by yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, is it like, what are some ways that maybe uh, an average person could affect the price of a, of a coin, we, either intentionally or unintentionally? Uh, you know, for the most part, we're talking about really illiquid, tiny markets. Mm-hmm. So if you want to, if you want to, if you want to provide value to a market, um, you know, a big way that you can provide positive value is by being a patient um, trader and by placing limit orders. And if okay. you look at, if you look at the exchange fees from pretty much any exchange, you'll see that there's more favorable fees for market makers, meaning those that place limit orders and wait for them to be taken as opposed okay. to market takers, which are people that come in and they say, I want this asset right now. And they press the mm-hmm. market buy button. So those are <laughs> takers. And, mm. um, you know, if you, if you provide liquidity in a market, um, you know, that has a really positive impact on the market, on that market as a whole, because now there's more availability for, um, for, you know, impatient traders to come in and transact with minimal transaction costs. So that's a really healthy way to improve and kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where a lot of these markets lack deep liquidity. And if you can Mm. provide that liquidity rather than just taking it, then it can kind of have a a net positive on 
um, the health of that market as a whole. Yeah, because you, know, you know, opposite than the bots, it's it's actual person providing liquidity also. So it is a real person who actually wants the coin. And yeah, no, that's a great point. Totally. And I mean, there there are legitimate. I mean, you know, that's kind of like a one side. That was kind of like a one sided example. But there's, you know, even even humans can serve as um, as true market makers. Meaning they like in these mark. Like if you look at um, if you look at like the traditional markets. Not just anyone can be a market maker, meaning that they're putting up, um, you know, both a, a simultaneous order to buy and order to sell. Not just anyone can do that. And, the, and in these markets, anyone can put up simultaneous, um, you know, offers to buy and offers to sell and be a market maker. You know, that's a really healthy way to participate. And, you know, that can be done, uh, you know, manually if you're setting a wider spread. Um, but, you know, if you're setting a, um, you know, kind of a, uh, a tighter spread that's going to have a lot more frequency of orders being filled, then that's something you'll want to do algorithmically, um, you know, via a bot. Um, but, you know, both options are very, very healthy um, to do in the in, in a market that you're trading in. Okay, before we end this, I really want to talk about also decentralized exchanges, uh, something I harp on a lot on my channel. But I'm really curious to know uh, what your thoughts, thoughts are on on decentralized exchanges, like what's working, uh, how they're beneficial, and also what isn't working, um, what you're hoping to be improved upon in the future. Um, and also, can there be good market makers put on decks to give it the liquidity that people so desperately need? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Decentralized exchange is like a true, fully decentralized exchange where every single operation is happening on chain is mm -hmm. a very, it's a very, very difficult thing to accomplish because you've got trans, like if you look at an exchange like Uniswap um, or like, or one like um, Ether Delta, you've got all of these, you've got these conditions where um, you've got an economic cost to move your orders. The problem is, you know, algorithmic market makers, which like I mentioned earlier, help provide market efficiency because they keep tight spreads and, and deep liquidity. And, mm -hmm. um, and they re they can react quickly to changes in, in the market elsewhere. So imagine a, uh, imagine a market is on a decentralized exchange and it's on a centralized exchange and the centralized exchange is moving very quickly because that's what happens, you know, in volatile small markets like cryptocurrency, these markets mm -hmm. move very, very fast. You know, the, the centralized exchange market maker can move their orders at no cost. They just pull them and replace them at different prices. The market maker on the fully decentralized exchange um, has to pay, you know, the um, has to pay gas every time they want to yeah. cancel an order and and pay gas again every time they want to place a new order. So they can't they can't move their orders as efficiently as the centralized exchange market maker can. So in turn, you've got less market makers on the decentralized exchanges, and as a result, you have less liquidity on the decentralized exchanges. So um, that's kind of like that's kind of like the vicious cycle there. And mm -hmm. I think the best I think the best solution right now is to have the um, non-custodial decentralized exchanges where you've got you know either You've got ba basically you've got the um, order matching engine um, is um, conducted off chain, and you've got the custo custody of assets um, that are done on chain. You know whether mm. that be whether that be done via a uh, custodial smart contract like in IDEX, or whether that be done wallet to wallet. Um, and, and transported via relayers like you have on radar relay or you know any of the zero x relayers. Mm. Um, I think I think that for right now is really the best solution while we figure out ways to decentralize those other functions without making it um, you know too too like without making it too um, inefficient for market makers. Mm -hmm. Good old scaling. It's the constant <laughs> thorn in people's side here. But yeah, um, that is a really good point, though, about 
uh, non-custodial, at least there it's that you are always in control of your funds on a DEX. I think that should definitely be the foundation um, because then you're not worried about the exchange, uh, you know, delaying your withdrawal because they're not done using your coin real quick to make a profit. <laughs> um, much like the fractional reserve <laughs> banking yeah. done in other banks. Exactly. Um, exactly. I mean, that's like, that's like the, um, that's like the deeper story behind, um, you know, the proof of keys movement. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just, it's not just philosophical. It's, you know, if you, if you don't own your, if you don't own your coins, if they're on, if they're on a centralized exchange, you, like you better believe that those coins are being put to work and, <laughs> yeah. you know, like they're being put to work and the way that they're being put to work may, might not always be in your favor. Um, you know, yeah. and I think, you know, I think that's another kind of hidden benefit for non-custodial exchanges, because like if you take IDEX, for example, um, anyone can look at the custodial contract and they can see exactly what the balances are of the of the exchange for every asset, you know, in real time. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. cannot like you simply cannot do that for any centralized exchange. It's just impossible. Interesting. Um, well, yeah, you definitely have, I don't want to keep you for too long, but I, uh, so much knowledge and I, th I hope this helped a lot of people realize what's really happening and, you know, be a better trader for it, pursue a better trading platform by using these red flags that you've given us. Yeah. So if, if someone, or yeah, also, if you guys have any questions about anything that was talked about today, leave them in the comments down below. Myself or Wesley will be happy to address those and get you some answers. Uh, Wesley, is there is there anything else you'd like to talk about or cover that maybe we didn't specifically cover yet? Um, I don't think so, but maybe if we get a lot of interesting questions that we haven't talked about, uh, we can follow up with another call sometime. Oh, yeah, for sure. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I'd really enjoy that. So, uh, yeah, Wesley, where can people reach you or learn more about Liquid Solutions Malta if they wanted to? Uh, yeah, time, here's your time to shamelessly plug yourself. No shame. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, I mean, if you're uh, if you're a project that is looking to bring uh, bring your coin to market, um, or if you're a project that has you know gone to some of the exchanges that we've talked about that haven't treated you so nicely. Um, you know, you can, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, the best way to contact me is either via Twitter at Wes underscore D-E-W-A-Y-N-E. -E, that's Wes mm -hmm. underscore Dwayne or uh, via Wesley at liquidmalta.com. Um, or you can reach out via the contact form at liquidmalta.com. And I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you, Wesley, so much for your time. Uh, definitely threw a whole bunch of education at people today. So thank you again. And hopefully you get a whole bunch of questions down below um, in the comment section and we can do a follow-up and really tailor it to specifically what people want to learn about. But I think we did pretty well today. <laughs> awesome. Me too. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Heidi.